Over the last few years, the Church of England has been reflecting on its teaching in the area of sex and relationships. As Christians, we are inheritors, not inventors. We have received the lifestyle and teaching of Jesus passed down through the apostles through the ages. And it tells a beautiful story in this area of sex and relationships. But before we get into that, we want to acknowledge we live in strange and difficult times and our gracious God has been powerfully at work in the world and in the Church of England. It's an incredible waking up to the gospel in our nation at the moment. People in the crisis of COVID are facing death. I think there's been incredible openness to the bigger questions in life. The Lord seems to be stirring things at the moment, whether it's the kind of COVID time or some of the issues of racial injustice that are around, I think perhaps prompted Christians to look outwardly a little bit more. God has been moulding and challenging people through lockdown. It's been really exciting to see how he stripped away his secondaries to cause priorities. As people encounter Jesus, they are just open to allowing him to begin to transform them. So what I'm really excited about at the moment is seeing people like me in the gay community become Christians. We've seen uh, encouraging signs of people who we've been serving practically with food parcels, coming on our Alpha course and coming to faith. I was talking to one of my clergy. He was saying that over the last year, the most number of people that have been baptised in his church are people who are recovering addicts in the Western Supermare area. So we've been giving away meals and seeing a lot of families coming to us, uh, particularly families from Muslim backgrounds. They see our church as their family and their home, and that's really exciting. There's so much to give thanks for. The good news is being shared in word and deed. But part of that good news, Jesus' countercultural teaching in the area of sex and relationships, is being called into question. Uh, some are wanting to argue for a different sexual ethic, others to more quietly forget about him. In contrast, we want to regain our confidence that what Jesus said and did, his lifestyle and his teaching, is good news for all of us. I used to think that I needed to meet someone and I needed to be married in order to be complete as a person. I needed to find my other half. And I tried and I hunted and I searched and I met people, but they disappointed me and they hurt me. I've been able to think through and be very reassured by what the Bible says, that we can live a whole, wonderful, fulfilled life, even without marriage and without sex. The world says if you want to be happy and fulfilled, you need to be in a sexually active relationship. You need to find that one or the many if you want to have many. And so the, the, the great thing you need is the thing it seems the Bible says you shouldn't have because the Bible's so clear that God's gift of sex is within marriage, which is for a man and a woman. Why would that possibly be good news if it's telling you can't have the thing that you really, really need? We're often left thinking, oh, what the world is saying is so much better. We're embarrassed by what we're saying, but actually, the world gets it profoundly wrong. Look at the mess that the sexual revolution has left in its wake. It's left isolated people. It's left family life increasingly destroyed. I grew up with a mixed up view, I guess, of sex and relationships. I was born to a single uh, mother. She was a teenager. And my kind of upbringing was one of real kind of confusion. So when I became a Christian, I was 18 years old. For the first time, uh, I met some Christians who, of course, their whole uh, worldview was radically different to the one that, that I held at the time. The world essentially degrades sex. It says it's about me, my performance, my pleasure. And yet paradoxically, it also deifies sex. It says if you're not having sex, you can't be free, you can't be fulfilled. And too often we respond either with a coy, prudish silence or with a cold moralism served with a hefty dose of judgmentalism, we're right, you're wrong, or and or hypocrisy. We don't live according to our own standards. And not surprisingly, that puts people off. In society at the moment, people are really looking for answers. As a nation, it's almost like we're growing up in increasing chaos. People are looking for 
uh, wisdom, advice, guidance in, in, in the chaos that people find themselves in. Over the last few years, hashtag Me Too has exposed to us all the damage that the sexual revolution, the sexual promiscuity has brought so many people in society, particularly uh, women. And into that context, loads of people are looking for someone who can speak with authority on issues of sexuality. Somebody who can say, look at me, follow me from a position of complete and utter integrity. The only person that can do that is the God-man, Jesus Christ. Somebody who has had a sexuality, who has a sexuality, and yet has not misused it, but has used it beautifully to serve and to love other people. One of the great privileges of being involved in Christian ministry is introducing the current generation to the one man that will not let them down when it comes to issues of sexuality. As we introduce this generation to Jesus, we offer a better story when it comes to sex and relationships. But that better story is part of a bigger vision of what it truly means to be human. The first question is not, what does the Bible say about sex? Um, the first question is, what does the Bible say about humanity? Um, what, what does the Bible say about anthropology? What does the Bible say about the way things are? And what the Bible says about all of those is that there is a God who made this world. And we're told in Genesis 1, it was a good world. That's the word that's repeated again and again. Back in creation, we're told humanity made in the image of God, male and female. There's a difference there. And actually, we're told that the difference is a fundamentally good thing. It's not good for the man to be without the woman. That's the one thing in the creation narrative that's not good. So men and women are made to be together. The Bible teaches us that sex is really special and really beautiful and a really wonderful gift from God, that it is part of the way that we are created to have a purpose in this world. Part of that purpose is to reflect who God himself is. Male and female, he made them in his likeness. So our sex is not something that is arbitrary, and the way in which we have sex helps us to either fulfill that purpose or to obscure that purpose. God speaks of himself through the relationships he's given to us. He's in distinction for the Son and Holy Spirit, and so the relationships he's given us have distinctions in them between male and female. And if we remove those differences, or if we redefine those differences, we're speaking less of him as a result. The Bible's a story. It's the true story. It's a romance, it's the love story that begins with the God who is love, who creates us in his image to relate to one another in deep friendships and to get married, a man and a woman, unity in difference reflecting the Godhead, unity, indifference. Not only does marriage point back to creation and to the unity and difference that we see in the Trinity, it also points forward to where this world is heading. We were created to be sexual beings. We were made to love and to be loved. So it's not a surprise that this feels huge to us. It's not a surprise that this is something that looms large in human experience. But the reason why it's so important is because sexuality, romance, love, find their meaning and purpose in the context of this bigger story, Christ and the church. could describe marriage as a trailer, not the sort of trailer that you pull with a Land Rover, but the trailer that you might watch at a cinema. Uh, what is the trailer that the cinema is seeking to do? Well, it's seeking to persuade you to, 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 to go to the film itself. And what marriage is in the here and now, the union of difference between a man and a woman, is a trailer that God has put in creation, a gift he's given us to make us want to be part of what each individual marriage throughout creation between a man and a woman has, has been pointing us to the wonderful reality of life in the new creation where we'll have union indifference again 
but this time between God's son, Jesus, and God's people, the church, which will be a marriage greater than any marriage in the here and now, one that will go on forever, one in which everybody, whatever their sexuality, will be involved. Marriage is not just simply a social contract. It's much, much more than that because it reflects Christ and his church. And that is a really wonderful, beautiful, sacred thing. Many people don't realize, I think, that the Bible is a romance. The Bible is a romance from beginning to end. It is about how God, our bridegroom, is wooing and winning for himself a bride. That is the church. That is the heart of what the gospel is. All the shadowy but glorious realities of marriage now are to prepare us and present us to him then. So that's why the best thing you can be is a Christian believer living all out for Jesus, whatever your sexual desires or preferences now, because fulfillment and hope and perfection free of pain is what's promised then. So live all out for him. When we teach the Bible on the subject of sex and relationships in the context of the big story of scripture, we will find, as I've found again and again, that people long for this. It's wonderfully attractive. And although it may well be convicting because none of us has lived as we should in this area, it also speaks to the longings of our hearts. No human relationship can ultimately satisfy those longings. But in Christ, the longings of our heart can partially be fulfilled by the Spirit right now and will one day be fully satisfied. I find that what the Bible says about sex and relationships as a single person, it frees me. Our future is secure in Christ and we're heading to being united with Christ in the new creation. It frees me as a single person not to be thinking about marriage as the thing that I'm aiming for, that I have to be striving for, that's going to complete me, that I have a marriage I'm waiting for, and I can get on with my life as a single person and live it completely and wholly and independently. A lot of the time people are just puzzled as to how someone like me who's single, who's uh, not married, who's made a decision not to be married because I'm same-sex attracted. A lot of people think, how can I be fulfilled? How can I be happy? Surely my life is gonna be a lonely one, a, a life starved of intimacy. People who think that haven't heard the good news of the gospel, of us as Christians being united to Christ and, and taking part in, in the life of the Trinity as a result, of us as Christians being adopted into a family and having brothers and sisters and a spiritual parents and siblings and children as part of the local church. My life is not a lonely, sad life, but a life that has at its heart an experience of intimacy in community, community with God, community with other people too. All of this is good news that can and does draw people into a relationship with Jesus Christ. For me, when I became a Christian and when I encountered this, this teaching, it wasn't something that put me off. It was something that compelled me to find out more. I have friends who are same-sex attracted, really close friends. I have friends who are living with their partner. I have friends who are single. I have friends who are married. I even have friends who are involved in adulterous relationships. And I think the message is still the same. The message is still that Jesus is better and it'll be costly to follow him. But I don't, want to, I don't want to take away that Jesus offers a new life and something better. I don't want to give them half a gospel that can't help them at all. I want to say it's radical and it's different and it's a change. That's what Jesus expects, but he's worth it. When I went up to university, I was aware of two big things in my life. One, that my sexuality wasn't as straightforward as I might have liked it to be. The other, that I was a Christian who wanted to follow Jesus, wanted to know him better, wanted to draw near to him. In one conversation with a friend, I remember a moment in which he said, it's not about sex for me, Niv, it's about love. And that really took me aback. It clarified for me 
how high the stakes were and what we were looking for. All of us, love, real love. And what changed me was realizing that in Jesus, I had discovered the source of perfect love. And so following him gives a shape to how I live. And that's true in the area of sexuality and relationships. And lining myself up with that shape will mean costs. It will mean actually directing my loves in a way Jesus calls me to. But every time I thought about the costs, I also had to realize that these costs were part of what it meant to say yes to love himself and discover the life he has to give in that. We want to hold up God's word, which shows his design for sex and relationships is the best way to live. That is what leads to life. The gospel, the good news of Jesus is for everyone, no matter who you are, no matter what your background, no matter what your sexuality, what any, anyone, every person in the world, it's for you. The problem is that the church hasn't always got that right. As we articulate God's vision for human flourishing, we need to keep recognizing that we ourselves have got things wrong. It is completely, completely right and proper that we need to repent. Repentance is at the heart of the gospel, isn't it? We have a, a, a ministry of reconciliation. And if we don't do that, then actually we are betraying the very ministry that Christ has given us. There are so many areas where we've got this wrong and that we have been straightforwardly homophobic in lots of ways. We have certainly been guilty of making the single life and the same-sex attracted single life a second-class Christian life. In our wanting to promote uh, marriage between one man and one woman, we have idolised marriage. We've idolised the family. Um, and I think that's been really unhelpful. It's often what people grow up thinking, I'm going to grow up and get married and have a family. And, and that's what everyone aspires to, but we've done it in the church. You know, you'd go to some churches and they'd, they'd, they'd uh, valorize marriage with probably 2.4 children. You'd never believe that this is a church that worshiped a single savior. This was the person who said, I have come that you might have life in all its fullness. He had life in all its fullness without ever having an intimate sexual relationship. Jesus managed to offer a radical welcome to all sorts of people. So when the church doesn't act like that and puts up barriers, makes people feel they're not good enough in whatever way, then we're massively failing at communicating in a very important part of the gospel. The teaching of the Bible is crystal clear on this issue. While we might make mistakes, God doesn't. So while we admit our failings, we do it without dismissing the claims of scripture. On this issue, the Bible is absolutely clear. And that's really important to say, this is not an issue where we could say, well, you know, we're not really sure. Uh, and actually that's, that passage is not really clear. The passages are absolutely clear. It's really striking in the whole discussion in this area, a very large number of what I might call liberal scholars, that is people who believe that the traditional teaching of the church is wrong, but who've studied the scriptures in this area, they are very clear. Scripture prohibits in every way, in every form, same-sex sexual relationships. And that is countercultural. We know actually from the evidence that in Greek and in Roman culture, there was a whole range of views, including an acceptance of what we might call something similar to same-sex marriage. And yet, script, the scriptural texts rule that out completely. And these scholars say, yes, we agree. That is what scripture says, but of course, we think the scriptures are wrong. There's legitimate room for disagreement when it comes to, say, the role of women in ministry. But God's good design for sex and relationships is non-negotiable. I know people say, well, we had, we've had women bishops and so this is the next progression. For me, it's actually, the, that argument works the opposite way around. There's actually, in New Testament culture, there was always an incredible 
honouring of women that um, was, went out above and beyond the surrounding culture. Whereas on this particular topic, the culture was actually really permissive, engaging. And yet the New Testament chose to uh, put almost like the most tight standards you know, uh, on, on what, where, where sex was permitted. The reason I think that gay sex is wrong is not just because of the, the standard verses that everybody turns to, but because of the big Bible story and how key marriage, a union in difference is to the whole Bible narrative from Genesis to Revelation. I would actually think that gay sex is wrong if, if none of those individual uh, verses existed because marriage is so central to the whole big picture story and isn't just about love between a man and a woman, but is most of all about the love between Jesus and his church. If the Bible teaches that homosexual sex, homosexual activity is sin, then a gospel ministry must include, must be willing to say that is sin and that must be repented of. As part of the LLF process, we committed to fasting and praying once a month because this is an important issue for the church we want to discern. And in the secret place, um, quite surprisingly actually, I, I sensed a sense of, of God's judgment um, that he does ask us to be obedient. So this is not a trivial matter. This is part of the apostolic teaching. I believe that Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. But I also sense that God doesn't take this lightly. The orthodox biblical teaching received by the apostles is unchanged. With new ideas being thrown at us, it's worth us slowing down and asking what are the harmful implications of rejecting the biblical teaching on sex and relationships. We can't fail to recognise that the majority of Anglicans are in provinces which stare in amazement at the way in which we are questioning what the Bible has to say over this divisive issue of sexuality. Now here I am as an English Anglican going to Nigeria and the people in the north are saying to me, we are giving our lives for this faith. Why are you making a mess of it? It puts things in perspective for you that we are indeed an Anglican communion. There is more to Anglicanism than, than the West. And whatever we do in the West will have an implication on how Christians are seen, especially in the Muslim world. What are we doing? <laughs> I think what I desperately want the Church of England to understand is that if it changes the doctrine of marriage, it is actually oppressing a group of LGBTQI people who have chosen to follow Jesus Christ. It would in effect crush them. It would crush me as a celibate gay Christian. And it would mean that our obedience wouldn't be celebrated in the church, that we would have no safe space to be. If the Church of England were to change its doctrine or practice in the area of sexual ethics, then for me, that would mean that I'm no longer in communion with the Church of England. And I've sat with my bishop and I've said, this is my red line. I don't want us to cross this. I'm not using this as a blackmail tool or to manipulate. I'm just saying in all integrity, this is no longer something that I can live with. In obedience to Jesus, we need to protect God's precious people from harm. What might that look like? I'm not sure there are many of us in the Church of England who want to leave the Church of England. Staying in is, I'm sure, the, the, the hope and the aspiration of most of us. Um, but as and when the Church gets to the point where it 
changes its teaching and its liturgy and its practice in these areas is going to be a moment for uh, people to have to reconsider their allegiance to the church at the moment. I want to be in the Church of England. I want to fight for the traditional teaching uh, of the church on these matters. But the time may come when it's going to be essential for those who hold to scriptural teaching on marriage and same-sex relationships to say we cannot operate under this particular system and support this kind of doctrine and practice within the life of a church. And that may then lead to having to look for alternative solutions. I guess if we were looking for an ultimate solution or where this might have to go to ultimately would be to ask questions about um, provincial arrangement. We have currently in the Church of England two provinces, Canterbury and York. Um, we may have to say, um, could we do something with the current provinces, organising them differently? We might want to say, is there any um, possibility of creating a third or a fourth province and perhaps allocating some of the current dioceses differently um, to the existing or new provinces? Um, no one knows the answer to this, uh, and I'm not um, offering a solution. I'm simply saying we may have to have that kind of a conversation in order that we can create safe, sustainable space for these clearly fractured groups across the Church of England as a whole. We want to keep the Church of England uh, in standing in the historic truths that it stood on. But uh, if it was to move away from there, then we couldn't go with that if it was, say, the blessing of same-sex unions. And uh, I know a number of people as they've talked through and tried to work out what steps would have to take, whereas it would need something really quite radical, um, even of a provincial nature, to provide an adequate place where people with integrity could stay true uh, to the gospel as they've been taught it and understood it. Although there's much uncertainty about the future of the Church of England, there are things that we can and should be doing now. I think when it comes to sex and relationships in the evangelical world, there really is uh, a need for us to, to come together on these issues. I think there's so much more that unites us than divides us. And actually what we hold uh, is a compelling vision for sex and relationships, one that we need not be ashamed of, because we do really have something to offer, of course, not only to the world, but to the wider church as well. I'm excited that it seems to me that God is bringing together an evangelical unity around this issue in a way that we've never seen before in order for us to, uh, to see the church that he's wanting to birth through all of this conflict. And so I have a very hopeful and a very positive understanding of what God's doing in this time. It's potentially very painful, but I think that we will see something happen with the unity of evangelicals uh, that we've never seen before because we finally realise that actually we need our brothers and sisters, and we really do. As one of the seven bishops who've been involved in the LLF process, I would encourage you to engage with it. So we've tried very much to ensure that arguments from different positions in the church are heard coherently. I think it's essential that we do what the bishops are encouraging us to and engage on this with our churches and congregations. And my experience is that when you do, you open a conversation that is, that is easy to have, people are happy to have it, people have been waiting for years maybe to know why the church thinks what it thinks, and that that, that is fruitful and positive to go into. I think it's important to say, let's engage, let's be involved in those groups, those discussions, let's argue the case. To be at the table, I suppose, is the message that I want to say to everybody, and do it attractively and winsomely, because we've got a good story to tell. So engage, engage, engage. There is a, a general synod election coming up in the summer of 2021. And I imagine that during the course of the 21 to 26 general synod, um, some kind of report will come back from the living in love and faith discussions around the diocese and there will be probably enormous pressure for some kind of change. So the elections in the summer, August, September 2021 are massively important 
and evangelicals need now to be thinking about whether they might be a good candidate. They need to be now asking who would be, if not me, a good candidate. And we need to be doing that in both the houses of clergy and laity. The message of the Bible remains the same. Human beings have fallen. We need a savior. That was why Jesus came. It's a beautiful message. We believe in him and we are saved. The way we're going, we are starting to attack that as a church. We might say, no, we're not there. We're gonna get there one day. Because if you keep moving the goalposts, where do you stop? You know, I'm really not interested in the culture war. I'm not excited by politics. I am very excited by the Lord Jesus Christ. I fell in love with him when I was 18. I still love him, not nearly as much as I should. And I'm called to faithfulness, as we all are, to the Lord Jesus. And so we, we shouldn't be longing just to teach morality. That's not it. We want to teach Jesus and the relationship of love that he offers and a marriage with him. That's at the heart of what we're offering. But if we're going to teach Jesus, we've got to teach the real Jesus, the Jesus who offers gracious forgiveness for the way in which we've mucked it up and we all have, including the area of sexuality. But he also speaks of truth. He says, now, if you're gonna follow me, if you're gonna come into a relationship with me, there's a cost in that. As there are whenever we make a relational commitment and enter a marriage, there's a thing we say yes to, a person we say yes to, the things we say no to. So let's be faithful to Christ and out of faithfulness to Christ, keep proclaiming him, hold on to the wonderful combination of to the full grace and truth and reflect him both in what we say and then how we say it.